Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. Well, as you may know, uh, Marlon is in Minneapolis this week. He actually is probably on his second message right now. Um, I did find out this week that he has to preach three times. Four times, I'm sorry, four times. So he preaches Saturday night once, and then he'll preach three times in the morning. So we only have to preach once here, so it's quite the step up. Uh, but uh, he's loving it. He's enjoying it. It's been a good thing for him. We found a lot of really cool things up there, because I don't know if you know this, but the best part about being a church is, is when you go to other churches and you see them do things, you steal it. And because all things are God's things, right? So when we're not stealing their stuff, we're just uh, using it, using God's stuff for us too. So find a lot of really cool things up there that I think uh, you'll see in the coming, coming months uh, that are going to be great. Uh, but anyway, we are on the Secretly Awesome series. And uh, last week, we really talked about doing the next right thing. And I, and I don't know if anybody's had any experiences with that uh, this week, but I don't know about you. It's been in the back of my brain all week long, every time I decided that I had to do the right thing. Um, I, I was thinking of that, and uh, I, I hope that kind of worked that way for you too, because that was our intention. Uh, but we were talking about doing the next right thing, and today we're talking about being the sidekick. Now, every superhero has a sidekick, right? Except for maybe Superman. I don't think he ever really had a sidekick. I think he had a super girl, and there was a super dog once. I don't know if you knew that or not, uh, but I don't know if I would consider them sidekick. But when you think sidekick, for me, I always think of Batman and Robin because Batman and Robin, I think, was the ultimate duo, and Batman was always so much better than Robin, <laughs> right? If, if nothing else, Robin did a really good job of making Batman look good. And as you can even see in this picture, Batman is so much more composed than Robin is. Because the sidekick was always the guy that was there in case Batman needed him. It wasn't like they were going out and they were going to equally share the load. It usually was one of them would get in trouble and the other one would have to help out. Uh, but there wasn't really any particular thing that they did equally. It was always kind of one-sided. Now, Robin, you could say, was the brains of the outfit. He really kind of added that piece that Batman wasn't always paying attention to, and he would bring it to his attention, and Batman would then, of course, take credit for it. Because a sidekick was really there to kind of lift up the hero. And you don't always hear about the sidekicks. In fact, the sidekicks usually don't get much attention. The sidekicks are usually the ones that save the hero, and then the hero takes out the enemy, and then the hero gets the praise for taking out the enemy. We don't really talk about the fact that the sidekick was the one that kind of allowed him to do that in the first place. And when it comes to being secretly awesome, sidekicks are the definition of that. I mean, here's some famous sidekicks throughout history. You can name all of those. You are awesome. There's some really good ones in here. Chewbacca. You know, nobody wants to be Chewbacca. Everybody wanted to be Han Solo. Some, some people want to be Chewbacca. Anybody? Yeah? No? Okay. What about Milhouse? Milhouse was the friend of Bart, and Bart was always the focus. Milhouse was kind of the one that gave him, gave him a little bit of uh, wisdom every now and then, but Bart was the one that stole the show. Tim the Tool Man, you remember that show? Oh, oh, oh. yeah, okay. <laughs> Somebody does, yeah. And Sam Wise Gemgee, he was, he's, the, he's an amazing sidekick. He really kind of pushed Frodo along as they were going. Luigi, he's another great one. You don't really see him very much in the video games. It's always about Mario. It's Mario. It's Mario. It's Mario. I kind of like Luigi. And these, these are what I would consider some of the big sidekicks. Uh, in the top right corner there, Garfunkel. Actually, it's kind of an interesting one. Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, if you don't know who they are, you're too young. Uh, but they sang a famous song, The Sound of Silence. And nobody wanted to be Garfunkel. Nobody had posters of Garfunkel on their wall. It was always both of them. And, and when, when they split up, who was the guy that really got all the attention after that? It was Paul Simon. Garfunkel kind of disappeared. But the interesting thing about Garfunkel was, is he was the guy that kind of brought it all together. Now, Paul Simon wrote a lot of the music. He wrote the lyrics. He, he wrote the sound. 
But Garfunkel was the one who kind of pushed it together. He would choose who sang and who sang what and what part of the music was there. And he kind of coordinated it. But you would never know that. And if, if, you, real, if you listen to the sound of silence, hello, darkness, my old friend, that part that you sing, that part that's going through your head right now, that's Garfunkel's part. Paul Simon sang the really boring part really low key part that never changed. He was the guy who was in the background, but you didn't notice that because Paul Simon, he was the face of, of Simon and Garfunkel, even though Garfunkel was the guy who sang the part that you sing. And he's still viewed as kind of the sidekick of the group, but sidekicks are everywhere. And I feel like a lot of us consider ourselves to be sidekicks more than we consider ourselves to be heroes. And I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with that. I think sidekicks have their place. And I think as we go through this, we are going to learn something amazing about sidekicks. And one of the sidekicks that we have been talking about up to this point is Barnabas. How many people, before we started this series, knew who Barnabas was? Who knew who Barnabas was? And there's very few hands out there. Because he's not in the Bible very much. Barnabas is a really small part of the Bible. However... Barnabas played a huge role in making it what it was. We can honestly say that without Barnabas, most of the New Testament would not have been written. And yet he's talked about in maybe four or five different chapters in Acts. Not very much at all. Barnabas was an amazing person. He was called the son of encouragement. In fact, that's what Barnabas means, that he was an encourager. And being called that was a nickname that everybody gave him. Because the people that he was around knew that he was an encourager. Knew that he was somebody that lifted people up and pushed them forward and helped them become what they needed to become. Barnabas was an amazing person. And yet he had a very small part in the Bible. He was the ultimate sidekick. And he's a great person. He's done some amazing things. He's changed amazing lives. And I think we can safely say that us here today... It's because of Barnabas. Now, outside of Jesus, Barnabas, I would say, is the most important person in the Bible. Really, he is. And I kind of want to explain that a bit so you can understand who Barnabas is and why I think he's the most amazing sidekick and the most secretly awesome person in the Bible. Now, I'm assuming people know who Paul is, right? Not our sound guy. We're talking about Paul in the Bible. Paul, he was a killer of Christians. He was really good at it. He was super good at taking out Christians, and Christians knew it. Now, if you know the story of Paul, at one point, Paul was on the road to Damascus, and he had a moment where God showed up, and he struck him blind. And he said, why are you persecuting my people? And there was this amazing conversion that happened right there, as he couldn't see. And he was led into the town. He was led there. And he comes across these people who know who he is. And he looks for refuge. And they go, no, nah, I don't buy this. I don't believe that you are really changed. And rightfully so, because he was at one point hunting them down and killing them. But there was one person that vouched for him. You know who that was? Barnabas. Barnabas was the guy who vouched. For Paul, who at this time was called Saul, Barnabas was the one who vouched for him. If it hadn't been for Barnabas, who knows where Paul would have ended up. And if Paul wouldn't have ended up in the right place, who knows if we would have had as much as the New Testament as we did. So he vouched for him. Barnabas was a very important person. Now, in the book of Acts, we're looking at the church of Acts, and that church is growing. And Barnabas was also part of this. Barnabas actually sold fields that he had, and he gave the money to the apostles. He gave of himself immensely and financially. And this church is growing. It's becoming amazing. It's, it's experiencing God, and it's helping people find Jesus. And there's a particular moment in Acts that starts out like this. It starts out and says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, which we've talked about Herod before, the bad Herod, and Saul, which will soon be called Paul. 
But I think the reason that you see this is because the church at this time was a really diverse group of people. There's a lot of people in this church, a lot of people growing, and these here were some of the prophets and teachers, the big ones, the ones who were really kind of leading the way. And Barnabas is the first one that's mentioned. It should also be mentioned that in the Bible, name placement was a sign of their place in the world. So the fact that Barnabas was mentioned first was a big deal. Barnabas, the encourager, mentioned first because of what he gave to the church and what he gave to these people. He vouched for Saul at that time. Barnabas is really living up to be an amazing person, amazing hero. It goes on and it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now see, these two, Barnabas and Saul, were called to go out and minister to the people. During this time, the Lord says, these two, these are the guys, you send them out and they are going to be working and doing the ministry of the Lord. And notice again the placement, Barnabas and Saul. Because Barnabas at that time was so important. He was the guy and he was leading the way. So in the scripture, it was set up to say Barnabas and Saul. So they went out. And they're on their way, and they're going to be doing ministry. And here, as they're going, they see this guy who is a false prophet, and his name is Bar-Jesus, B-A-R-R-Jesus, which I can only think of as kind of like a fake Jesus. And I think he was kind of riding the waves of who Jesus was, and he was doing all of these things and saying all of these things, and he's just misleading people because he didn't know anything about it. And of course... Barnabas and Saul see this happening, and Saul, also Paul, follow along here, Saul sees this happening, and he rebukes them. Now, that's just a really fancy word for a backhand, okay, because he really took it to this guy, and he said, what you're doing is wrong. You're misleading these people. You shouldn't be doing this, and because you're doing it, the Lord is going to have his justice on you, and at that moment, Bar-Jesus was struck blind, And it comes on the heels of what Saul is saying to him. So, of course, everybody goes, wow, who's this guy? Who's Saul? What is he doing? Wow, that's amazing. You see what he did to that guy? He really took it to him. And they start going, Saul, Saul, Saul. And they talk, and they they start talking about Saul and what he did. And they see this guy. This is his first shot out there. And he strikes somebody blind. The next verse says, From Paphos, Paul and his companions. It doesn't even say Barnabas anymore. It says Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. It just says Paul and his companions. Things have changed. People started talking. People realized, wow, this Paul guy is really something. Did you see what he did to Bar Jesus? And Barnabas just gets mentioned as a companion. So as you can see, this has changed drastically. So they continue. So they're going out. Now now comes the time where Paul is going to give an amazing sermon. you, you got to read it. It's, it's a kind of a long one, but it is amazing. It puts anything me or Marlon has ever done to shame. Seriously. It is awesome. He basically chronicles from the beginning of time to where they are now and how God had interacted with his people. And then Jesus came along and then what Jesus did and how he interacted with his people. He basically just told the entire history of God and Jesus up to that point. And he slam dunks it. And people know it. Paul, Paul. Paul. People are saying, Paul, look at this guy. He's amazing. Man, he used to be killing people, but boy, did he make a change. Woo, Paul, Paul, Paul. Where's Barnabas in this? Barnabas, the encourager, man who really vouched for Saul, who set him up to be who he was. He taught him what he knew. They worked together. They learned together. Barnabas taught him over the years what he should know. And and this speech that he's giving about the history is even more of a testament to the fact that Barnabas taught him all of this. 
Barnabas was setting Saul, Paul, up to be somebody amazing. And it says this, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving after the speech, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas just became a sidekick. And we don't read about Barnabas very much after that. Barnabas and Paul at some point kind of get in an argument as to what they should do. And they split ways. And you don't really see it much. Barnabas was really trying to vouch for his cousin to come along with him in the ministry. And Paul says, we don't need more family in this. And they kind of split ways. And they're done. And Barnabas, you just, you don't hear about him as much. That's not to say that he didn't still do amazing things because you got to believe that because of who Barnabas was, that he would continue to be that amazing. And he was. Barnabas was something else. But you don't hear about him as much because he really became the sidekick. And you see, it says Paul and Barnabas. Paul is first. And you know what? This is really awesome. If you're Paul. <laughs> right? And we feel that way. We all feel that way. We, we feel that way when we interact in normal life. We kind of feel like this guy. Kind of give him one of those like, yeah. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> and we got to think that Barnabas was this way, but he wasn't. Barnabas was so happy for Paul and what Paul had become. He had raised Paul up to be this sort of a person. He supported him. He really made him who he was. And Barnabas was secretly awesome and an amazing sidekick. And he knew it. He also knew that this life, this story, what they're going through, and it wasn't about him. He also knew that it wasn't about Paul. And Paul equally knew it wasn't about me. And when all of those things work together, you see an amazing sidekick to a person named Paul, who was an amazing sidekick to God and his mission. And yes, we can feel like this way. And I know we do. And I know I do. You see somebody do those backflips and you think, I can't do that. And when they do, and everybody's plotting for them and saying, you're amazing. And you're in the back going, I can't do that, but that's great for you. Because <laughs> we all kind of feel that way, right? Let's not pretend that that doesn't come into the equation. We're sinners. We're broken people. That's human nature. We feel jealousy. We, we hate it sometimes when people get the spotlight and we don't. But we have to know that being a sidekick means being absent from the spotlight. And there's a really big spotlight. And you know who's in it? Jesus. And when he's in the spotlight, we can't be. And we become an amazing sidekick to Jesus. Now, if you look throughout history, people have kind of had that same feeling that we did. You know, you're thinking about what we can or can't do, and you see other people doing it, and they're getting the applause, and they're getting the praise. We give that half smile. That's happened before. It's not just us that happened in the Bible. And you can see that in all these different places. You can see in the story of David and Goliath. At that time, King Saul. Interesting. King Saul. There you can see on the right. That's an actual artist depiction of what he looked like. No, it's not. We have no idea what he looked like. <laughs> but in this story, Saul was the first king. And he was appointed by God. And Saul became a person that he shouldn't. And God said, I am done with Saul. And for that reason, David was raised up. And David, you know the story, he fought Goliath and he took him down with his sling. And David steps up and he takes the place of Saul. He brings Saul down. And David in that moment becomes the new king because Saul let so many things get in the way. Saul was filled with pride and selfishness and the need for control and pomp. He really enjoyed all of the people looking at him and he was in the spotlight and he said, you know what? There's only room for one here and it's me. And let me tell you, when you jump into the spotlight... And you take that spotlight away from the one true person who deserves it, he's going to kick you out hard. 
Because that spotlight is for Jesus and his sacrifice for us so that we could be here and that we could know what it means to live a free life through him and his sacrifice. And that spotlight is designed to have Jesus in it. It's designed to have God in it. And here he said, no, I'm not having this. You would think, you would think that somebody like him would see somebody coming like David and go, hey man, come on, get over here. Let's do this together. Let's knock this out. But no, human nature and a sinful heart and sin inside him caused him to turn his heart to stone and be filled with pride and think he was the only one and be the one that's in control. And he ultimately paid the price for it. God will not stand for our pride. Because everything we can do, everything that we have, everything that we are, is given to us by him. And to claim otherwise will cause us to be taken down just like a giant by David's sling. Another story, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. Nah, that's not what it was. Joseph, if you know this story, he did get that coat. Now, Joseph, an interesting choice here too. You know what Barnabas' actual name was? Joseph. Huh. I think the Bible really likes irony. Because you see in this situation that somebody like Joseph really makes the bad choices. In this story, his dad, Joseph's dad, says that Joseph really is going places. He's really awesome. He's really great. And he gives him this coat. And of course, rather than accepting it humbly or filled with grace, he struts out in front of his brothers. And he knows that he's chosen. And he knows that he can interpret dreams. And he knows that he's really good at things. And he goes out in front of his eight brothers, seven brothers. And he says, hey, I got some dreams to interpret. And you guys are going to listen. And he tells them this dream that basically makes them all look like they're less than him. The dream was true. But the way he said it and the way he did it and the way that he went about it was so wrong. And you know what happens when you have that many brothers and you're a real big jerk to them? <laughs> you get thrown into a hole and you get sold to slavery. I don't know if that'll happen nowadays. But if you have that many brothers, don't test it. See, he thought he was everything. He had it. He knew it. It was part of him. It was part of his life. He thought he had it and because of pride and arrogance in this and, and his egotism, the fact that his father was praising him and giving him this robe and his ignorance to the fact that his brothers would be receptive to him being a jerk caused him to pay the price. Threw him in a hole, sold him to slavery, all because his pride said, I'm in the spotlight. And again, when you put yourself in the spotlight that should be reserved for God, the creator of the universe who created all of us, who made us who we are, who's given us every ability, who's given us every nickel, who's given us every single talent. When we pull him out of the spotlight and put us in it, we are asking for it. And you may need to go down a real dark road to realize who God is in your life. And someone like Joseph went down a long, dark road. And I can only imagine God going, you know what? You really don't understand this, do you? You know what I think would help? Eight years of slavery. And this journey that he went on, this journey that what caused him to grow and become a better person inevitably led to him being somebody, but it took slavery, it took pain, it took that to get him to those points. And we have a choice too. When we see what we can do and we see how good we're at it and we see how much people look at us and give us the wink or applaud in our general direction, we have a choice to understand that we have that because God gave it to us or we have that because of something we did. And when we do that, we kick God out of the spotlight and God's going to get back in it. And again, he may need to take you down a long, dark road to get there because God, being an amazing father, like any father would, disciplines his children when they do wrong. And we deserve it because we don't really truly understand who God is in our lives when we jump into the spotlight. 
when we take credit for what we do, when we're happy with all the money we have, when we're proud of all the friends that we've made, when we take stock in who we are and what we've accomplished, those things cause us to fall. Pride is mentioned over and over and over again in the Bible because it's important to know that God has put us where we are and we need to use that to put him in the spotlight and take us out of it. We need to know that every follower of Jesus is a sidekick. Now, when we first started out, we were talking about the sidekick and we're talking about how it seems like sidekicks have a good spot, but ultimately we want to be the hero. Nobody wants to be Robin. Everybody wants to be Batman. You want to be the one that saves the day. But this statement is so different. This statement says that no matter what, no matter how much we lead, no matter how talented we are, no matter what we do for other people, we're all sidekicks. That takes the focus off of us. That takes the focus off of what we do. And we realize who really is the hero and who really deserves the spotlight. It says in Galatians, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the Bible isn't how we get to God, but it's the story of how God got to us. Because God's the hero. Jesus is the hero. They're the ones that deserve the spotlight. And I'm only here today because God sent his son to die for me, a sinner. So that I could continue my mission as his sidekick to bring glory to him every day of my life. We need to realize that we're sidekicks and sidekicks are awesome. Yes, there will be days you get to be the hero. Yes, there will be days that you get to lead. Yes, there will be days that people will give you applause. But if you take it and make it yours and jump into that spotlight, even for a moment, God's going to say no. Because all glory to God for what we can do and what we are and where we go and what we say is simply because God is amazing and chose to let us do it, chose to give us these talents, chose to have us be who we are. There is nothing that I am without Christ. There's nothing that I can do without him. And that's where we need to know that the spotlight's reserved for him and that we are sidekicks, awesome, secretly awesome, Barnabas-like sidekicks. We need to give of ourselves without needing anything in return. We need to give to other people without expecting praise. Some of the best things you can do in life, you can do for other people, and they may never know you did it. And that's okay, because God knows you did it. And God will show you favor in those moments. Jesus loves me. He's for me, but it's not about me. Jesus has got your back. He will help you through the struggles in your life. He will help you with the problems and the issues and the fights and the hate and the money struggles and the job struggles and the vehicle struggles and all the stress you go through. He's got your back. He loves you. But even in all that, it's not about us. It's about the fact that people know who Jesus is. Through those struggles, through those times that we're dealing with pain and suffering, when we glorify God by telling other people that he is our savior, God gets in the spotlight. When we tell other people, you know what, I'm going through some bad times here, but I know who's in control and he will get me there. We glorify God. We put him in the spotlight. And God loves the fact that we become his sidekick. That we become the person that he desires in us so that we can show other people who he is. Christ in me. That's what he means when it says I was crucified on the cross of Christ. I'm no longer who I was. I'm now a new person. And that new person is going to tell other people about who Christ is so that we can spend eternity together. And that through life's struggles, we'll know who's in control. And we will know who will get us through it because God has our back. 
He loves us, but it's not about us. It says in James 4, 6, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So we're talking about pride again, because that gets in the way. We really want to be the person that's in the spotlight. I've told the story before. I told the story about how I was the little old lady from Pasadena, and that was my moment to shine. And I'll never forget that because it was a moment where I did. I felt like people like me. People think I'm funny. People really want to see more of me. And you start to build yourself up. You go home, you throw all your clothes away, and you buy brand new ones. Because people, people are paying attention to you. And I love this. Because we do. We love it when people pay attention to us. We love it when people think we're amazing. We love it when people see what we do and go, Great job, man. And it was only a year later at the next talent show where I was stood up by somebody else who was better and funnier than me. And was crushed. Because we will be crushed. When we become prideful in who we are, the world really loves to show us that there's somebody better than you. I don't know about you, but when we were watching those videos of those people doing the amazing stuff during the break there, the fact that they can do it so well makes me never want to try it. I mean, really, do you feel that same way? You're like, oh, well, he did it already. Why do I need to do it? That's exactly how I feel. Because when we look at those things and we make those the pinnacle of what we want to be, and we start to take pride in ourselves and what we're doing, it will fail. Because there's always somebody better than you. And the only way to get over the anxiety that comes from knowing that there's always somebody better than you is knowing that God is better than everybody. And you'll no longer have that pride. You'll no longer have those struggles because you will know that you serve the creator of the universe and that he has a plan for you and it involves some hard times, it involves some good times, it involves some times when you're going to be a leader and it involves some times you're going to be a servant, but you know who's in control. And all of a sudden the anxiety of becoming something more than yourself is no longer there because you don't need to be. You just need to be more like Jesus. And when you're more like Jesus, you care less about how other people perceive you because Jesus didn't care. You start to stop being prideful in yourself because Jesus was never prideful in himself. Jesus was a servant to those. The night before he was put on the cross, he wrapped a towel around his waist and he cleaned everybody's feet. You know what a big symbol that was back then? Everybody wore sandals in a time that didn't have pure gel that you put in your hands and make everything clean. So your feet were the dirtiest part of you. In fact, when people ate, they laid on their stomachs so their feet were so far away from the table it wouldn't contaminate the food. And Jesus, God in flesh, wrapped a towel around his waist and cleaned their more than likely poop-covered feet. Because Jesus is who we want to be like. Jesus gave us the example that somebody such as himself who was in God would come down and serve us. And then we have problems serving other people. We have problems giving the spotlight to other people. We have issues with that and we struggle with that. And because of that, we fail to become more like Jesus. So how? How to be the best sidekick? Because followers of Christ are always sidekicks. We're all sidekicks. So how do you become the best one? First thing is this. Lead humbly in God's grace. We have opportunities to lead people. And there will be moments when you are leading. And leading is a burden. It's not very good. Leading doesn't always end up in awesome times. In fact, leading you will end up hurt more often than anything else. Because when you lead people, you lead brokenness. And you realize the brokenness in them. And you realize the brokenness in yourself. And leading people becomes a burden and a struggle. But when you lead people, you lead humbly in God's grace because God puts you there to further the mission, which is to make sure that everybody you're leading knows who Christ is. So lead humbly 
in God's grace. Use those moments. Be a Barnabas. Be an encourager. Help people. Grow them. Know that someday you won't be in that position and somebody else will. Look down the road to where they're going to be and set people up to be awesome. Set people up to be like Paul. Understand that it isn't about you and that we're all sidekicks. Because when you understand that and you lead these people and you lift them up and you show them who Christ is and they live a life that's like Christ, that's an amazing moment. Because people need you to lead them humbly and gracefully. That's how you can be an amazing sidekick. To lead humbly in God's grace. And the second thing is to serve in God's favor. It says that God opposes the proud and he shows favor to the humble. More often than not, we won't be in the leadership position. We're going to be in the serving position. We're going to be in the position that says that I'm going to help you. Let's do this together. How can we get through this? And when we're doing it, we need to know that God has favor on us in those moments. That God is for us when we serve others sacrificially. When we focus on other people knowing who Christ is, when we focus on helping them become who they can be in Christ and pushing ourselves down and becoming the sidekick that we need to be. We talked about doing the right thing last week. Sidekicks do the right thing. And the right thing is stepping out of the spotlight and putting God into it and allowing other people to do the work of God by supporting them and leading them. So as you go, this affects everybody. If you have a business and you're leading people, learn how to lead humbly with grace, serve those people as their leader, and God will show favor on you. Use those opportunities at your work, at your business, to impact people's lives and show them who Jesus is. Because if Jesus really is the best thing that we could ever give anybody, why isn't that what we're telling everybody all the time? And we show people the amazingness that is Jesus by being an example of who Jesus is in our lives. And we do that by leading humbly, serving people, helping them go from a Saul to a Paul and inevitably taking our names out of the front line and putting them behind somebody else's. That's how we become secretly awesome sidekicks. Let me pray with you this morning. Heavenly Father, all glory to you who saved a wretch like me. Father, I pray that we always look to put you in the spotlight and that we can humbly and joyfully step out of it. Father, I pray that you can make us your most amazing sidekick. I thank you for your son's sacrifice for me and for everyone here. And I pray that through the struggles and through the problems and through the issues that we will inevitably encounter, that you will rightly be in the spotlight and you will help us through those moments so that we can continue to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Because Jesus is who he says he is and he did what he did, we are no longer slaves to sin. What does that mean? That we're no longer slaves to those things that drive